Hello, Michigan music lovers. This is Scott Baker, musician, music journalist, and producer, welcoming you to the Michigan Music History Podcast, covering all the territories of the mitten. We cast from around the block of the brand new Michigan Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Bay City, Michigan, in the heart of the Great Lakes Bay region. And I'm joined by Michigan Music Royalty, sitting to the left and right, Dr. J. Gary Johnson of the Michigan Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and MichiganRockAndRollLegends.com website, and Sir Fred Reif, Michigan music author, publisher, manager, and musician. Together they have taught, lectured, traveled, hosted, and have been quoted worldwide on all things Michigan music. Chances are you stood next to them at the record store or shoulder to shoulder at concerts over the years. They are the record crate diggers and the library micro fishermen that have dug around for the details, the credits, and the lineage that has been part of the backstory of Michigan music. So grab your favorite beverage, hit the cruise, and take a trip back with us as we open up a can of earworms on Michigan's rich music history. Welcome to the Michigan Music History Podcast Show, channeling through all styles and eras of Michigan music from before you were born up through this very minute. And now, your host, Scott Baker. Welcome to the Michigan Music History Podcast, MMHP in the 989. Coming at you here at the end of March. And, uh... We had a nice, beautiful week last week, and we're starting to get back to the regular spring, end of winter, blah blah blahs. But uh, it, you know, it's it's not shouldn't be too horrible. The overnights aren't, at least aren't freezing, not down here anyway. Well, not until maybe tonight. Uh, <laughs> I think the hammer's coming down tonight. Yeah, as of today, their hospitals are filled almost back up to capacity. Mm-hmm. Central and basically schools are closing, and yeah. Essexville started sending people home today. Wow. Yeah, it's uh, not good news, that's for sure. No, and uh, from the sounds of things on the nightly news, it's not just here. So, Right. A Maybe. big venue in uh, Detroit had to close again. The Blue Goose. Oh, yeah. Everyone that worked there, except two, got, got the virus. Oh, my goodness. <sighs> that's a f- pretty famous Detroit yeah. venue. Yeah. As, for jazz and blues yeah this is uh i don't know man it's you think you know everybody's happy that the shots are coming out and a lot of things are getting loosened up but at the same time nothing's in play yet for safety purposes and i think it's a, um with spring and summer coming on people wanting to you know get out of the, them cabin blues uh we might find ourselves back in another lockdown here. yeah i hope not uh maybe the bad weather coming in will kind of you know keep people from congregating in in real tight uh circumstances and uh maybe we can kind of bring the curve down a little bit i hope so yeah i uh want to point out a couple people to chime in to give me a correction here (laughs) mr Uh, don richard in canada he's my old buddy at dick wagner studio he uh, wanted to mention that i said the wrong uh frost record when we were talking about the frost frost music album that day that had come to the studio back when i was there it was a uh, the best of Fr- the frost that i was thinking of that we weren't aware of but they also sent us the live at the grandy ballroom uh on vinyl and uh that came out they both came out during that period and i was i miss i said an album had come out in the 70s that i thought was the name of it but don's like the the keeper of the 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 wagner flame he was the right hand man for he has every detail and knowledge of every step dick took so i want to thank don for uh pointing that out and i wanted to make sure we made that correction it was the best of that i was thinking of from that frost podcast now that was the uh the grandy uh performance that was at least in part on uh on the um rock and roll music album yeah yep yeah. Yep, that that was that one, and that was that came out with them like on the the the, the frozen right the glacier yeah the glacier yeah. yeah yeah but that, the one that we were unaware of was the best of thing I think that I was it came to mind I was like I remember Dick going okay you know like was surprised yeah. but uh, those were the two that came out in the early aughts that Vanguard mom um, still does and uh, I guess it, it was cool also to see that Vanguard still wanted to do something. You know when they could be doing many things that have to do with bands nowadays on the frost so 
Yeah, that's cool. I hear I hear the frost about once a week on deep tracks on Sirius XM, so they're still getting some radio play too. Well, oh, good. They deserve it. Uh, it's our last podcast with Gary for uh, about. 10 weeks or so and uh he's taking off on a little vacay and doing his work and we are gonna talk about two serious michigan artists that are in the michigan rock and roll legends hall of fame that uh both sir fred and dr j have extensive detail and background on uh one being john lee hooker and the other who we'll start with uh, mr del shannon what you got on del shannon there gary well uh one of the all-time great Michigan rock and rollers uh, so influential uh, I'm not sure that people appreciate how big an influence Del Shannon was on the British invasion groups uh, and he was one of those artists Buddy Holly being another uh, that was actually more popular in England than they were in the United States and Del Shannon also um, has the distinction of uh, being the first artist to chart with a John Lennon and Paul McCartney song. Um, and I can remember this so well. I was in high school, I'm a big Del Shannon fan, and I think it was either May or, um, May or June of 1963, and uh, Del came out with a song called From Me to You which uh, the Beatles, it was really their first number one song in England uh, earlier in the year. And they had opened for Del Shannon. He did a, um, a concert at the Royal Albert Hall. The Beatles were the opening act, but of course, wow. you know, they were red hot in England at that time. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he really liked the song. And after the... Uh, after the show, he talked to John Lennon, and uh, you know he wanted to record it. And and the um, the way he approached it to Lennon was, you know, if I record this, uh, this will give you some exposure in the United States. And so uh, you know the Beatles were all for it, and uh, so Dell records it. It wasn't that big a hit. It did chart, but I think it was like maybe 70 some 73 or something like that but uh still it was the first time i had heard a uh a song by the beatles i you know had no idea who they were at that point um but uh you know the uh, this getting a little off track here from del shannon but those early beatle records were pressed in owasso michigan really they came out uh, their first one that was released in the united states was their previous 45 please please me and that was pressed at owasso and that one's kind of famous because owasso put their own uh they would put the the labels on the 45s and they misspelled beetles they it has two t's oh. so uh, a very collectible uh beetles 45 I'm probably not many of them were pressed because you know yeah. nobody knew who the Beatles were uh, in uh, in uh, late '62 or early '63 when that first came out, and they also pressed uh, "From Me to You," <laughs> that came out on VJ also, uh, and uh, you know it it didn't happen for the Beatles until um, 1964 with "I Want to Hold Your Hand." What were the flip sides of those two pressings? Do you know? uh well the flip side of uh let's see from me to you what the heck was the uh i think it was thank you girl okay um i wouldn't Might swear be, to yeah, that right. and uh love you. what was uh i can't think of please please me it was on their first album mm. uh I, I can think of the two can't mm -hmm. think of the title um but anyways uh so Del Shannon, famous for that. <laughs> did uh, he get printed on VJ two, or was was or was he on a different label? Did they go through a wassail for his printing of the Beatles? No, no? he was um, Del Shannon uh, was signed to Big Top Records. Okay, and uh, that was kind of an interesting story too. Uh, just shows you how sometimes happenstance can lead to great things. Um, he was discovered by 
an Ann Arbor uh, disc jockey by the name of Ollie McLaughlin. And uh, Ollie was the first black DJ in, um, in Ann Arbor, very successful, uh, you know, had a tremendous audience among uh, college kids and high school kids and so on. But anyways, uh, uh, he knew Max Crook. Max Crook was a keyboard player who hooked up with Del Shannon and they were playing in clubs uh, in Battle Creek. And so um, Max Crook was after Ollie to come and see him with the band. And so uh, uh, Ollie, apparently McLaughlin, was a big U of M fan. And uh, he had to give up uh, watching the uh, Wolverines <laughs> on television and drove to Battle Creek. And that's where he saw Del Shannon. Wow. And from that point on, he thought there was some real possibilities. Uh, he was friends with Harry Bach, who was a big um, man in uh, in Michigan music. He uh, he discovered Little Willie John was his manager for a while, and then um, after he left Little Willie John, he found Johnny and the Hurricanes, mm -hmm. and uh, they had a number of hits. And so he was looking for a new artist and. Uh, so this is how Del Shannon got linked up with Harry Bach, and that's Harry Bach was the guy really that hooked him up with Big Big Top Records in New York, and uh, you know run, run away with it. Run away uh, <laughs> becomes an enormous hit in uh, 1961. Number one, number one, and also um, you know Billboard magazine. Uh, oh, uh, each year they would. Um, designate the song of the year and that was pretty much by which song had spent the most weeks in the hot 100 and uh runaway was billboard's song of the year in 1961 and del shannon is the only michigan artist who has ever had that distinction of having billboard's song of the year mm -hmm. Wow. Now, when he was out, in, uh, and you obviously heard Runaway before you heard the Beatles song and all that, did you know he was a Michigan artist at the time, or was it just a guy on the radio? That yeah, had a hit? I, I had no idea he was from uh, Michigan. So it wasn't like, because you were in Michigan, you were hearing him, you heard him because he was big. Right, right. Uh, yeah. It, it was wasn't just... like the Frost where they were regionally big. It was because he was just, he nailed the number one hit. Yeah, and, and it was never, a, uh, and no one ever said anything, like on the radio, that this guy was, you know, born in Coopersville, Michigan, right. which is just a little town about uh, 15, 16 miles uh, west of uh, Grand Rapids, more of like a rural farming community. Uh, so no idea whatsoever that he was uh, a Michigan artist. I was, I, I was uh, backtracking uh, like I did uh, on a few other ones we've done. And to see that he came out of the Army and pretty much went to Battle Creek to play where he was found, like you said. Yeah, that, well, that's where he got his start. Yeah. Uh, you know, he was a, a good guitarist. And uh, he won a talent competition when he was in the when he was in the army and that got him into special services so for the last um, you know number of months of his hitch you know he was spent most of his time performing you know for other service people but uh, yeah fascinating and then of course the uh, you know one of the things about uh, runaway was kind of unique was the the instrumental sequence you know, it just sounded unlike anything else you'd heard on the radio at that point. And then come to find out, it was Max Crook who had it invented, really, this keyboard instrument, sort of like a predecessor of the synthesizer, and he called it the Musitron. Uh -huh. And so there's a Musitron solo in um, Runaway. It just so You can hear it. Oh, Everybody yeah. that knows that song can hear that, yeah. And, and then on the, on the follow-up, which was also a gigantic hit. Hats off to Larry. Uh, Max Crook played the Musitron on that one as well. But it's kind of, uh, he invented this thing, but he couldn't patent it because all he had, uh, it was kind of like a, what do you call one of those things? Uh, um, a Rube Goldberg kind of thing <laughs> where he was taking parts from other 
uh, instruments uh, and other electronic parts and uh, kind of jerry-rigging him into this keyboard. And so um, he could never patent it because some of the parts oh, wow. that he used were already patented. <laughs> so, uh, you know. I, I always wonder what happened to that musician. Yeah, you know, wouldn't where, that be? Is he whatever happened to him? I mean, that's a I, guy. He, he passed away. Okay. Do you remember that, Fred? He passed away not too long ago, maybe a year or two. I think he passed away in Ann Arbor. Okay, but so he has. He still has family in the state. I wonder if we could track that down for the I, Hall of Fame. That would be interesting. Yeah, that's a little I, piece of uh, yeah, holy grail him, there. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I wonder if that is still around, or if they, you know, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland has got it. Oh yeah, yeah. stuck down in a basement yeah. somewhere, you know, gathering dust. It could be, it could be there. Yeah. Knowing that yeah. one, what's your uh, recollection from that time period on that, Fred? Oh, I was a big fan. I I remember all those hits. Uh, <clears throat> I was still in high school. Yeah, did you see him at Van Canyon? No. He he played at Van Canyon. Oh, that's oh, really? cool. No. I yeah. Didn't. Oh wow. That had to have been a big ticket show. It was after a football game. Oh, wow. Now, this is when I was in I was in Mount Pleasant. I was in college. I didn't even know about it until later. But, yeah, he appeared. Um, this would have been probably 1966. Wow. Um, nice. Well, yeah. after Runaway was a huge hit. Oh, yeah. Yeah, actually, he was kind of, at that point, um, not on the charts quite as often. Um Kind of a fallow period there after. And, and you know, his Beatles song that came out as a single that didn't really chart huge, that came out before that they were on Ed Sullivan, right? Oh, yeah. That came out, um, like we said, uh, would have been May or June of 1963. Mm -hmm. And the Beatles, of course, made their historic performance on Ed Sullivan. I think it was in February oh. 1964. So it would have been. <laughs> You know, seven, you know, roughly seven months, seven, eight wow. months later. Excellent. Oh. Did he have anybody uh, play with him? At, do you recall at that Band Canyon show? I don't know. No. Uh, I'm sure he must have had a band. Is there anybody out there that has any remembrances of that? Please uh, post on our page. Yeah, our in Facebook fact, page. it might have been a local band that, that bad. Oh, for sure. <laughs> wow. You know, that was pretty much, uh, I know the, uh, the epics. Uh, used to they backed um, Freddie Cannon, and uh, I know the Delrays backed Bobby Goldsboro when he was there, uh, but no one that I've ever talked to mentioned backing Del Shannon. Huh. So you know maybe he had his own group yeah. that traveled with him on little the Battle Park. Creek Band or whoever he was with or whoever. Well, it wouldn't, have, that, it that wouldn't point, have been yeah. uh, it wouldn't have been uh, Max Crook. Because after the two big hits, a big top offered him his own recording contract. And so he put out a number of uh, instrumentals under the name Maximilian. Ah. Uh, but oh, really? nothing hit. It wasn't Max Crook, it was Maximilian. That well, was just one word, uh, yeah, one name? That's what he recorded under. under uh, what label? It I, was I on think, Big Top, I think. I'm pretty I sure it was I Big have Top. A 45 by. A Maximilian. Uh, that is him, then. Wow. Wow. So he, he took on a, uh, his own little way after that. That's yeah. pretty cool. That's a side story of, of, of a, I never knew any of that. So that's amazing. Wow. So Del Shannon, he took off and uh, played up here then. And he, he did, I noticed he kind of faded on and off throughout the years. Not just recording-wise, but also as um in popularity, obviously. I mean... British Invasion came along, and so did Seventies. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he, and you know, but he he did some pretty good recordings. So he he also uh, put out a forty five of uh, the Rolling Stones um, under my thumb. Oh, really, which was a pretty good version, I I think, but it was very much like the Stones version. So it, uh, you know, that that was a even though the Stones didn't release that as a single um it was uh you know it was from the aftermath album which was you know probably sold several million copies alone mm -hmm. um so it was kind of a regional hit i know it was played in michigan i remember hearing it on the radio but uh it didn't make the national charts but he you know he recorded a lot of uh, good stuff um 
in the 1980s, uh, Tom Petty was a big, big Del Shannon fan. I see. He produced Drop Down and Got Me? Yep. Uh, drop, drop Down, yeah. Or maybe I have it get wrong. Me. You can drop Get Me, maybe? Get Me, yeah. yeah. And uh, that was kind of a comeback for Del Shannon because he uh, one of the songs from the album was A Sea of Love which was a big, big hit by Phil Phillips in the Twilights, uh, again, back when I was in high school. And um, Del Shannon updated it, I think probably about 1981, and uh, that was his first chart hit in uh, some time, and also uh, his first album in a long time. And it was, uh, you know, the Heartbreakers played on it. It was really a pretty good album, to say the least. Wow. Um, so... Uh, anyways, uh, you know, and Del, um, Del Shannon had always been, uh, you know, a big uh, figure in Tom Petty's life and career. And um, the last thing, and in, in fact, it was the, the, you know, we were talking about our, our favorite um, albums by Del Shannon, of course, uh, John Lee Hooker. And the one that I picked uh, for Del Shannon was his very last one was called Rock On. And um, that was kind of co-produced by um, Tom Petty and Jeff Lynne. And this would have been after Jeff Lynne had produced um, Full Moon Fever mm -hmm. for Tom Petty. And also, I, I think it was Jeff Lynne that produced the Traveling Wilburys yeah. records also. You know, and it has that certain sound. I have not heard that, but reading the backstory on that, they said that after Roy died, there was the rumor had it that he was going to replace Roy and the Wilburys. That was the big rumor. I don't, I don't think that was really going to happen. Um, it has never continued that much after yeah, that. Yeah, right. I don't think they really intended to take it on after uh, Roy Orbison or keep it going after Roy Orbison died. But anyways, um, they were working on an album, um, and it was during. Uh, the recording of this album that Del Shannon committed suicide, <sighs> uh, which what a shame because yeah. you know they, they it wasn't completely done and uh, Rock On wasn't released until a year or two after uh, Del Shannon's death, and um, you know you can hear the possibilities how how good this album probably could have been it's still pretty darn good i mean there's some classic songs the uh the lead track um uh which is called uh, walk away it's just classic stuff and but it's got that sound you know that uh, uh jeff lynn had a, a certain production yes. sound <laughs> you, know, you can pick it up on on all the artists that he recorded like tom petty uh, he had that big uh, album, uh, Cloud Nine, yeah. George Harrison, uh, The Traveling Wilburys, uh, Roy Orbison's last um, album, Mystery Girl. Yeah, absolutely. I yeah. mean, it all has that sound that... Uh, that uh, Full Moon Lynn, Fever, even. Yeah, and I, I, it's hard to describe. It's sort of a little bit uh, electric light orchestra. It always reminds me a little bit of the Beatles. Yeah. Uh, it just has that particular sound that's very distinctive so that's all the way through this album uh it's got a couple of great uh originals in there walk away being one uh um, instead of runaway <laughs> yeah right uh lost in a memory great tune uh i got you and then a couple of really really good um covers uh one of i go to pieces which Del Shannon wrote and gave to Peter and Gordon back in 1965 it was just a gigantic hit. And I guess Harry Bach was still his manager at the time and was just angry that he uh. gave away this song. He said, you know, it was just a guaranteed uh, big smash for him. Uh, but, you know, he, he was just a, a really an interesting guy. What kind of fool do you think I am? Another just absolutely great cover. Yeah, just a, a really strong album. And uh, it's just a shame that, uh, you know, that that happened. And, uh, you know, uh, Del Shannon's second wife sued uh, the Lilly Corporation, who, who produces Prozac, 
because Del Shannon was taking Prozac and uh, in her lawsuit she claimed that that contributed to his, his suicide. So I read he had a really bad bout of depression. Yeah, and, and that's, uh, it, Prozac was used uh, to treat that, but in some cases apparently it didn't work. Oh, you know, Lord. and that might have been in, in the case of Del Shannon. You know? oh. Wow. So a sad tale. One hell of a way to end it. I yeah. see, and I know uh, Petty sang that song, oh, Me and Del, we were singing, and a big yeah. lyric in uh, one of his big hits there. Yeah. They, they were working together quite quite smooth back then. And when during, that was yeah. a I'm Full Moon Fever, if I recall. Too. Yes, Running Down a Dream. Running Down a Dream, yeah. Yeah, it mentions Name Check Del, uh, you know, the idea of driving down and singing to Runaway yeah. on the radio. <laughs> did you ever get to meet him at all? No, I, I did see him... Uh, at the Saginaw, uh, uh, well, it would have been Wendler Arena in those days. And, they, you know, they were, uh, back in the 70s, they had a lot of oldie shows. And uh, I saw Adele perform. Unfortunately, um, he was drinking. Oh. And this, this is one of the strangest things I ever saw. Uh, he came out on stage, and he, apparently he thought the band was behind him. And the band wasn't out there. Oh. So he starts, and there's no band. Oh, man. So, I mean, he turns around. Yeah, it was pretty embarrassing. But, uh, wow. you know, he, he recovered to do a pretty good performance. But, you know, obviously he was. Not in the right frame of mind. Yeah, right. Yeah, I might have had a few under his belt there. <laughs> Do you ever come across him, Fred, in your, in your no. travels? No. no. Did you ever follow him, or, or did you have a... No, just his hits. Yeah. Were you tuned in around the, the late 80s when uh, when he was on a little bit of a comeback there? Yeah. I, I see he re-recorded Runaway for Crime Story, the TV show, in 86, and he had another hit with it again. Yeah. One of the few double hits of the same song, even two different recordings, which is pretty fantastic. Yeah, that was their theme song. Yeah. Crime Story. I just wondered if, because uh, you would have been doing a little bit of your research back then, if that you came across him at all or anything. No. Nothing, eh? Okay. Yeah, he did some production work also. Uh, he discovered a, a group called Smith, not oh. the Smiths, you know, <laughs> the, but a group called Smith that had a, a, you know, kind of an attractive female uh, lead singer. And they did a, a kind of a rock version of Baby It's You. Uh, this would have been, do you remember that was a big hit for That was, I don't know, maybe 69 or 70 oh. or something like that. Uh, he also uh, worked with Brian Hyland, and uh, I think uh, he produced to Brian Hyland, if I remember correctly, it was Gypsy Woman, the old impression song, and uh, he produced a cover version for Brian Hyland that was a big hit. And Brian Hyland played at um, Band Canyon also. Wow. Incredible. I only yeah. saw the birds there. Yeah, you know, that first year or so, Band Canyon had some pretty big names. Wow. You know, Sam the Sham and the Pharaohs. Uh, I mentioned yeah. Bobby Goldsboro. Did Freddie Cannon open up the he, he opened the place and then came back uh -huh. for the first year anniversary and played again. Wow. Because he played downtown Bay City as well. Oh, That's uh, wow. the uh, My friend Paul Barrera owned the Fortress North. Right. And he had Freddie Cannon. Jeez. So this had to be, because I had my store in Bay City, 75, 76. Okay, yeah, that would have been about 10 years after he appeared at uh, Band oh, Canyon. Yeah, that's true. Huh. That's incredible. I, uh, yeah, I don't have an extensive background on Dell other than I knew the big hits and stuff. But uh, Dell Shannon, yeah, Suicide, 90, uh, 1990. Yeah, and uh, you know, like I mentioned, uh, you know, besides being a member of uh, the Michigan Rock and Roll Legends Hall of Fame, we also celebrate uh, the great songs by Michigan artists, and, and Del Shan is represented by, <clears throat> of course, Runaway. <clears throat> mm -hmm. That was the very first song, you know, when we started voting. That was overwhelming, you know, this song that was selected uh, by the people that, that voted on that, wow. uh, you know, as the very first or, you know, when we started voting on that, that was the number one song. Mm -hmm. uh, but all, uh, a couple of years later, uh, also, uh, Hats Off to Larry was voted in. 
and uh, keep searching will follow the sun, which was his last big top 10 single. <laughs> but, you know, Dell was in that era of it was all singles. Yeah. You know, the albums were afterthoughts. Ooh, that know? was my next question was, yeah. do, is there any nice compilations or is there any collections on him or, or what oh, are yeah. you aware of? Uh, or anything yeah, there, there's a greatest hits collection uh, that Rhino put out that has 20 songs on it. Um, that's pretty good, but you don't get the uh, the Tom Petty, yeah. uh, Jeff Lynn stuff from the 1980s. This is all pretty much uh, a collection from the 1960s. But if you want the 45s, the hits, that's a good one. Okay. But, uh, you know, those, uh, those two albums that Tom Petty was involved with, are pretty interesting if you're number one, if uh, you're a Del Shannon fan, but also if you're a Tom Petty fan because the Heartbreakers yeah. are playing on it, and uh, you know you can kind of hear his influence on that. Oh. So that's kind of cool. I, I will be checking them out. Being a Petty collector, oh, I, definitely. I know he's they back to when they back to uh, Johnny Cash, and then they uh, they've backed Dylan Live, yeah. and there's other things, but uh, that's one that somehow escaped me. But I knew about it because I remember him talking about Del Shannon and when Del died on MTV. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, well, the, the Heartbreakers are such a great band. Yeah. And, it, you know, again, what a loss, you know, to lose Tom Petty. <laughs> Jeez. I mean, such a Way major, early, major right? artist, you know, and such a great rock and roller. And uh, Del went in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 99, and you had him in the Michigan Legends in 05. Yeah. From what I gathered off of Wiki here. And uh, that's serious, serious uh, legend right there, and you're right of our own state. I see they got a nice little uh, uh, memorial up for him in his town. What what's the original town he's in? Coopersville. Coopersville. Yep. Yeah, now Lynn and I uh, traveled to Coopersville. Um, primarily, I wanted to see it because at that time, um, that memorial that's in front of the Coopersville Museum. Uh, was only the second um, memorial uh, for any rock and roll artist in Michigan. The other one was Hitsville, USA. So, I mean, huh. you know, Michigan, with our tremendous history with music, has been pretty negligent about, uh, you know, celebrating it yeah. in, in, in any uh, official way. So, anyways, we went there. It was real interesting. The... Uh, the curator of the museum. There was nobody else there, uh, you know. So we talked to him, and he knew quite a bit about the history of Del Shannon in uh, Coopersville. He was kind of a, a black sheep, a little bit of a rebel uh, in this very conservative small town, <laughs> and uh, he had a Del Shannon's uh, high school yearbook in there. And uh, a number of other kind of interesting uh, pieces of memorabilia. And the high school that Del Shannon attended and graduated from in Coopersville is still there. Really? It's not used as a high school anymore. It, I think it's used as an administration building. Oh, but no. it's still there. So just a small little town. Is his little house still kind of available or any of those things? Uh, I, don't I don't know. think so. No? I don't think so. Okay. But, uh, I didn't know if anybody went to into the town to find where he it, lived. It was, or it was fun to uh, to go there. I bet. That's, that's a cool story. And it's and it's something that anybody can do anytime. Go yep. Make a travel to there. And, you know, yeah, it's funny. It's not that far from Grand Rapids. No. You know, where there's a lot going on there. So You can go all around the state and find agricultural uh, little <laughs> memorials but such a little bit on our rock and roll people that yeah. uh, it's nice to have one and nice and it yes. looked cool it looks cool like I saw the online photo I'm like that's a cool yes. did a nice job with it very nice maybe someday we'll get Madonna here <laughs> maybe <laughs> back to that one yeah, uh, yeah. not oh. if it has anything to do with Bay City government I don't think oh, right, right. how long was uh, Dale with Ollie for the whole time or? you mean with uh, Ollie McLaughlin right well um at least through the um, big top years, because okay. if you look at the 45s, uh, Ali got involved in the publication because it'll say, um, um, or not public uh, publication, publishing, uh, because this is McLaughlin publishing on the, um, the 45s. And then, you know, there was a big ruckus with his management 
and uh, I I think that's where Ali kind of departed. And by that time, he was doing some, uh, you know, he had his own labels. He had three uh, record labels, Karen, Carla, and Moira, all named after his daughters. And he was putting out a lot of R&B music, probably most famously The Cool Jerk by the Capitals and uh, Love Makes a World Go Round by Dion Jackson were his two Barbara biggest Lewis, hits. Oh, well, yeah, and he was producing all of Barbara Lewis's stuff. Uh, you know, he had a, he had a very close um, uh, relationship with Atlantic Records, and Atlantic uh, distributed Ali's labels nationally. And, of course, uh, you know, Barbara Lewis um, recorded for Atlantic, but Ali produced her records. And so, uh, yeah, he had a lot of things going on. Um, so, uh, yeah, he wasn't hurting after, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, he, he parted company with Del Shannon. But, you know, it's uh, he's the guy who discovered Del Shannon. So it's pretty Someone uh, in my record collecting business, was looking for a Ali McLaughlin W A A M. That's the station he was on in Detroit. I mean in Ann Arbor. Ann Arbor, yeah. And this guy is willing to pay thousands of dollars for any. Yeah, I know what you're talking about, Fred. Uh, this guy contacted me, and really? well, I was in touch when I wrote. Um, I, I you know I wrote a biography of Ali. Uh, as he was an honorary member of the Michigan Rock and Roll Legends Hall of Fame. And I was in contact with his youngest daughter, Moira, who put me in touch with one of Ali's that best friends. Name. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, well, that's what I say. He named his three labels after his three daughters. And uh, I also interviewed Ali's son. And anyways, um, this guy contacted me because he read the um, uh -huh. biography and... Uh, then I put him, I wrote Moira, Moira and said, you know, I don't want to give him your address unless it's okay with you. And uh, so anyways, I put him in touch with her and she was out there looking. And, uh, you know, he was looking for air checks and different right. things like that. And uh, the top 40 list. Right. I don't right. think he had one because I, when I lived in Ann Arbor, I asked a lot of people. Okay. And no one can remember any kind of actual piece of paper. Yeah, you know, and I, I think he were, when he was really a popular DJ, that probably wasn't quite as common to do that as it was a few years later, where you could go to any record store, you know, around our area, and there was the WKNX, the WSAM, and WTAC, they were all over the place. But yeah, the ones from the 50s, where that's when he was the top dog in Ann Arbor, uh, probably weren't quite as common. Well, there's a little bit of uh, the Del Shannon world for our podcast listeners. And uh, we're going to turn it over to um, Sir Fred here. What's up with John Lee Hooker in Michigan here? Well, John Lee Hooker came uh, to Detroit in 1943 to, you know, to work at one of the plants. He got a job at uh, Ford. And it wasn't until 1948 that he got with Bernie Bethman to record Sally May and Boogie Chillin'. Boogie Chillin', I think, was the B-side. And uh, that became the hit. And still today, it's that is the tune. Boogie, Boogie Chillin'. Boogie. That's Boogie kind of the style. Right. Yeah, right. right Not just a song, recording. but a style. Exactly. Right. You know, and that there's a case that could be made that that might have been the first rock and roll song. There you yeah, go. Yeah. You know, that's the endless argument. Oh, the first rock and roll song. What year was that one? 1948. Yeah. Okay. He, he arrived in Michigan in 43. 43. I got four. Yeah. So he, did you notice a little backstory before that? They they were unsure of his birth date, right? And he, and he was born in Mississippi, 1917, and then they got they got some stuff that says in 1920 that he was the kid of the family for at least uh, three to five years. But, <laughs> you know, I I was reading that, and on the way here, I was thinking of um, 
all of that. How would he get his passport to go to Europe if he didn't have the correct date? Oh, the management, man. <laughs> if he, yeah, if he could go to Europe, he had a manager, so someone pulled oh, yeah. some strings. Because yeah. yeah. that wasn't an easy thing for anybody to do back then without, a, you know, just coming, you know, especially the blues artists is what I'm saying. You know, they, well, he recorded, uh, like I said, for Bernie Bestman, and uh, he leased it to Modern Records out in California. And they released um, a number of his hits or songs, but also he recorded for a number of different labels under the names of Birmingham Sam and his guitar, John Lee Booker, Johnny Williams, Texas Slim, Little Pork Chops, <laughs> Delta John, and Johnny Lee. And there were a few others as well. I used to have uh, the Birmingham Sam and his guitar 78. Whoa. Yes, it was my pride. I think I got it at Mays down in Detroit. And in one of my many moves throughout the years, it broke. Uh, right in half. They Oof. are very fragile. I wanted to keep it, but yeah. I just thought, what am I, I can't play it. So yeah. I had to throw it away. <laughs> I took a picture of it. I'll say that yeah. might have been <laughs> framing. I would have yeah, framed that broken framed thing. It. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I wish I'd have <laughs> thought of that right. then. Yeah. <laughs> I, I also saw he frequented the blues clubs on Hastings Street in Detroit's yeah. East Side, all the clubs and bars up and down there. Okay. Now, Eddie Burns, who played with on a number of his recordings, told me many, many times that there was no blues on Hastings Street. <laughs> so that's and a he, Wikipedia ghost thing out there. Well, other than like John Lee Hooker, um, but I'm not sure if Henry's Swing Club was on Hastings. But um, most of Hastings Street was jazz, jump blues, R&B. And... Uh, you know, the, that area had blues, but it was more on the side streets or, you know, other streets. Okay. Well, there's a famous photograph of him playing at the Apex Bar where he had like a little combo with him. Uh, you look like there might have been a second guitarist, uh, maybe the bass player, uh, right. a drummer, uh, maybe even a saxophone player. Right. He had a sax player. Jerry wow. Hooks, I think his name was. But um, I have uh, Bobo Jenkins, who we talked about in another podcast. He was a photographer at the Harlem Inn where John Lee Hooker was playing at the time. And uh, I've got a picture of John Lee that Bobo took in my book. He's talking to a couple ladies in the audience. And it's a pretty rare photo. And he's pretty young at the time. And, uh, but he played up until, in Detroit, up until, I think he moved to California around 1970. And that was the same time he recorded an album with uh, Canned Heat. Hooker okay. and Heat. Yeah. His first, actually his first hit album. Right. The first one that charted anyway. I mean, I'll get know. to that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was after that he moved to California that he had his biggest selling records. But personally, I prefer just himself on guitar. Yeah. Tapping that's his cool. foot. Yeah. yeah. That's when that's the blues. Right. I mean I, I love Santana and I, I have all of Santana records, mm -hmm. but I just I'm Van Morrison. Well that too, but the Santana and, and John Lee Hooker, that album the, is that the healer? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. I just, yeah. the real blues fans never really cared for that one. You know what's yeah. funny is, though, you, he went out to San Francisco. Or, is that the area, right, San Francisco? Oakland. Yeah, Oakland, okay. And he, he that's where he made his biggest records. But at the same time, it, it reminds me like of uh, Muddy Waters stories. He had some great blues albums, but it wasn't until John uh, Johnny Winter jumped on board and they got a different label thing, different vibe, and all of a sudden... The, well, they the, tried it with electric mud. Yeah. But that didn't work. 
But you know what right. I mean? It, it's like the whole, you need almost a change of scenery for them, for them guys to get noticed. It's a similar story. Sure. Yeah. But the lyrics to some of those songs, like on The Healer, I, I was listening to it the other day uh, on the radio. They were playing it. It's the blues. It's the blues. And he says that throughout the song. <laughs> Basically, it's the blues. <laughs> and, it, and you think, okay, what's next? <laughs> but um, I, I've gotten to see John Lee Hooker a number of times. And um, my favorite has always been, like I said, just himself and his guitar. Um, the first time I did see him, it was at the 73 Ann Arbor Blues Festival, and I was the co-producer of the uh, special Detroit Review show. And John Lee Hooker was supposed to start the day instead of ending it. They were going to have him start it before my review because these were all his old bandmates and friends from Detroit. Well, he got there late. He drove in his band, the East West blues band or something like that they drove from california and they they got there late so john sinclair told me to well this is your show you got to tell him that he can't go on and i thought oh my goodness so i went over to his trailer and at the time they weren't gonna reschedule him later so i had to go over there and say i'm, I'm sorry mr hooker but um you got here late and you know you, you missed your spot and i felt so stupid doing that and then uh in the middle of my show john sinclair and peter andrews came up with the idea okay we'll put him on at the end which he should have been anyways yeah and it was a great show and then i i saw him at uh notre dame no yeah, Notre Dame, they had a blues festival, and I had booked Dr. Ross at it. And Dr. Ross had never met John Lee Hooker. So I was married at the time, and my wife and Dr. Ross and I were having breakfast, and John Lee Hooker and his band came in. <clears throat> and so Dr. Ross, I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, he's, you know, pretty big in the blues world. And he started to get all nervous. He's going, oh, oh, I got to meet him. I got to meet him. Fred, Fred, go, go introduce me to him. And so I went up there and I said, um, Mr. Hooker, <laughs> I think I said, um, Dr. Ross would like to meet you. And he was right behind me. So, you know, and he peeked around and he goes, oh, so glad to meet you, sir. And he was just real giddy meeting John Lee Hooker. And uh, he was real nice, he, real friendly. He stuttered. He was one of these guys that when he talked, he stuttered. Not in his singing, but... Uh, and another time I saw him was in Lansing, and that was by himself. And that was my favorite. Okay, yeah. Back to the roots of it, just him yeah. alone and the guitar. Well, his blues are real sparse and they're real, like on my album pick of the week was John Lee Hooker Live at the Cafe Gogo, -Go, which came out in 1966. Uh, my friend Steve Nardell, oh no, that's when it was recorded, it came out in 68. My friend uh, from Ann Arbor, Steve Nardella, who was originally from Providence, Rhode Island, he was in New York for that gig. And he's, he was telling me he was sitting right behind Otis Spann the whole time. He <laughs> said it was just, because this, this is backed by Muddy Waters' band. Oh, really? They were double booked that night, or, you know. Booked together. Booked uh, together. Bill, yeah. And uh, so I, apparently they had it worked out that Muddy's band would back them. Uh -huh. And maybe he did a solo set. I don't know. Wow. Now, what, what, where, where is that venue located for that record? Greenwich Village. In New York. Okay. New York. I, th I, thought, I thought it was New York. Okay. And uh, the first song on there, I remember when I first bought this song and I put it on my record player, I'm bad. 
like Jesse James. I thought, wow, this guy is bad, man. Yeah. <laughs> man, that voice is just something else. And, uh, of course, Otis Spann's playing the piano, and there's some great piano on here. Wow. But uh, he made many, many, many records, and there are so many albums. Between him and Lightning and Hopkins, there's hundreds of records they made. And, like, I'm sure some of John Lee Hooker's were like Lightning and Hopkins. They, the record company would put the best of Lightning and Hopkins, and he made them up all in the studio that day. Right. Um, so it was the best of that day. Well, you know, I picked that <laughs> uh, going through my John Lee Hooker collection. I always liked uh, I liked when he recorded on VJ Records oh, yeah. out of Chicago, and uh, one of the uh, one of the records I really liked by him was uh, called Big Band Blues. And it was kind of a misnomer. You'd think it was like a big band behind yeah. him, but you know, it was just a whole mix of things. But it had um, the original version of one of my favorite songs by John Lee Hooker, Don't Look Back. Oh, the original yeah. version of it. Oh, so good. And then, uh, uh, you know, again, just like what you were talking about with uh, Lightning Hopkins, uh, VJ also put out uh, the best of John Lee Hooker. Which has Boogie Children, uh, uh, Boogie Chillin' on there, which of course he didn't record for uh, um, VJ at least originally, so it would have been a re-recording. But it's also got the original version of Boom Boom, Ooh. which uh, John Lee Hooker recorded with members of the Funk Brothers. Really? Oh, so yeah, that's that's actually the song that that introduced me to uh, John Lee Hooker, only it wasn't by John Lee Hooker, I it was think by me the Animals. Too. Me too. Yeah, I, I picked them Animals. John Lee Hooker, who's this guy? Right. And, uh -huh. uh, yeah. Uh -huh. So okay. just like Fred and I were talking about this uh, before we started the show tonight, that, you know, in my case anyway, uh, my introduction to the blues uh, really came via England. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. through the Animals, the Rolling Stones, in the Yardbirds, and a little later on, Savoy Brown. The Peter, Kinks. Uh, Peter Green, Sweetwood Mac. Yeah. The Kinks did a cover of Lazy Lester's song, I'm a Lover, Not a Fighter. Oh, yeah, that's right. Back one in 65. Right, one of their early albums. Yeah. And they did it just pretty much like his version. Yeah, yeah. But that's how I got into the blues, too. And sure. John Lee Hooker was Boom Boom by the Animals. Yeah. And I do, I do <laughs> love that period where Santana grabbed a hold of them uh van morrison went out and did stuff with them yeah and they come i think that that held them through the 90s quite a bit put his put them back up there in the popularity allowed them to go touring again and and he made know. a lot of money yeah yeah this mm -hmm. time yeah well that was the reason why he, you know, he was putting all those records out under a variety of names is you wouldn't get any money from record sales uh back in those days so uh, he was getting money up front, you know, right off the bat to get right. the money, record, uh, figuring, you know, that... Uh, do what you, know, you want with it after yeah, I got he's paid. Never, he's never going to get any money from the, the recording itself, so he got his money up front. And, uh, that would be a great Rhino Records project, is to go dig up all those names that he went under. Collect well, as much I, as you I'm can. I'm sure there is. There's got to be a, a gigantic box set of John Lee Hooker out there. When, I would you think would have, so. Yeah, yeah I, I didn't look into that. I'm not sure I'm, right I now. haven't really heard of any. But. Yeah, Rhino put out a pretty good um, single and double disc collection of John Lee Hooker where they collected some of his most famous cuts from, you know, all the variety. You know, he recorded on so many labels, mm -hmm. Chess, and, you know, Fred mentioned Modern, and I've been we talking about DJ, Blues Way. I mean, you know, there were just so many of them. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, and Fortune. I had that record on Fortune. Yeah, that's a, that, that was a part of uh, quite a bit of um, It was terribly recorded. Yeah, the new book, uh, Mind Over Matter, right. uh, talks about, you know, where Fortune had these early recordings by John Lee Hooker, and for one reason or another, did release them. You know, they didn't release them until years later. Mm -hmm. uh, and also... Um, well, you probably know Eddie Kirkland. Oh, right? yeah. 
who we did a lot of gigs with him. Yeah, well, he, th there was a very long uh, segment of interviews with Eddie Kirkland talking about traveling with John Lee Hooker, <laughs> and uh, Eddie was the muscle. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, if uh, you know anybody up until was, he died, he yeah, was anybody he, was <laughs> giving John Lee trouble. Uh, they had to go through Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> well, he also did the driving. He fixed the cars. Yeah. He probably was the roadie. Yeah, yeah. he did it all. Fixed the amps. Yeah. I yeah. remember the last gig we did with, I, I was playing with Lazy Lester, and we were in Cleveland, and Eddie Kirkland was on the same bill, and I looked at his amp, and it was just filled tape, you know, uh, masking tape all over the place. Duct tape. <laughs> Duct tape. <Yeah>. And... Uh, <laughs> His guitar had tape, and you know, and, and on his break, he went out because there was something wrong with his car. So he went out and was working on his car on a break. <laughs> He's not meeting and greeting the audience. He's out there working on his car right now. And He's he could still do flips. It was amazing. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I, they were writing about that. I can't even imagine. So he could do a, a back backward flip, you know, just like you see some football yeah. players do it. You know, in the end zone. <laughs> yeah. But for many of uh, John Lee Hooker records, it was him and Eddie Kirkland. Yeah. Wow. And then uh, I think on VJ, he had uh, Jimmy Reed, Eddie Taylor played guitar. And I think Jimmy Reed even played harmonica on wow. some of them. Wow. There's a pairing. Wow. Well, Jimmy Reed, the time I saw him at the Ann Arbor Blues Festival... <laughs> His wife, I mean, this is well known. His wife was right behind him, whispering in his ears the next lyrics to you know, yeah, a song. Yeah, I heard about that too. And on some of the records, you can actually hear her. Really? I, <laughs> Jimmy Reed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I, it was very embarrassing because this, I think, was her first podcast. I, I, I think I mentioned that... Uh, you know the Draytons had played at our wedding, and they had played our our, our wedding song, a Johnny Re uh, a Jimmy Reed song, and I couldn't remember the title. Hmm. Honest, I do. Oh, oh. <laughs> uh, you know, which is uh, every time that comes on, it reminds Lynn and I of our of our wedding. <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> but again, you know, there was a, a, a discovering Jimmy Reed through the Rolling Stones. Yeah, because Honest, I do was on their first album yeah and it was just like all these people slim harpo and rufus thomas and uh yeah yeah they were uh, they were real blue scholars it's it's amazing that these young guys from england uh were just so turned on to this american music and here you know uh we american fans really didn't know that much about it you know it just wasn't something that was played on the radio you know I mean, you would never hear john lee hooker or muddy waters or howlin wolf or jimmy reed or you know any of these people on the radio there's no yeah. chance um so yeah it's amazing how they would discover these folks and uh you know champion them and actually really revitalize their career did yeah. you ever get to see john lee dr j no i did not i, I, I never I went did either. several times to the ann arbor blues festival but i had I didn't get a chance to see him. I wish I would have, you know, but I did get a chance to see him most or many of the other big blues stars. Right. Now, the bill that you had to tell him he couldn't go on, was that, you said 72, 73? 73. 73. 73. Uh, what was his reaction like, and what was his reaction after he found out he could go on, and how did you guys go through that? Well, when I, when I went in the trailer... I said, Mr. Hooker, blah, 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 blah. And he just looked and he goes, oh, all right, all right. All right. He was cool. Yeah, he was all right. You know. oh, yeah. oh, wow. Well, he also knew John Sinclair and Peter Andrews. And I, I just had a feeling he knew something was going to work out. And I, uh, I knew something was going to. You because, thought something was going to work itself out then. Okay. Because they traveled by van all the way from California. Mm -hmm. and, right. You know. Yeah, and he's you know one of the stars, so actually it was it was better for him to go on later because then he got the yeah because I think he left right after, but 
for him to be there throughout the show, he got to hook up with a lot of his old friends. Did he get to say talk to you before he went on and found, or came no. off? No. No, you didn't see him? No. I was just wondering if he gave you the old thumbs up or a wink or anything, you know, like, mm, no. <laughs> I got in here. But the, the last time I did see him was 1992, and Boogie Woogie Red had just passed the day before, and John Lee Hooker was in Detroit, and they had, a, I don't know if it was a Detroit Blue Society or whoever hooked it up, but they were getting John Lee Hooker and his old friends and bandmates from Detroit and it was at uh, Meadowbrook. And so I, I get there, I rush there and uh, get backstage. And I, I thought I'd be the first one to tell John Lee Hooker that Red had passed away because Red was supposed to play piano behind him. So I go up to him and I said, uh, I think I was calling him John Lee now, but <laughs> You're on I'm first, older. First name basis yeah. with him. <laughs> And uh, I said, uh, you know, I, I said, I'm sorry, but Boogie Woogie Red had passed away last night. And he goes, uh, 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 I know. You know, he was stuttering. And he said he knew, so somebody already told him. Hmm. But uh, he had on that show uh, Mr. Bo, Eddie Kirkland, Little Sonny, and unknown bass player, an unknown drummer. I can't remember who they are, but Eddie Kirkland was there, and I think I put that photo on our website. Okay, that's the one. Okay. Yep. yep. Wow. Fred, and, did you ever run across Michael Erlewine? You know, the prime movers? Oh, yes. And he was, he was very much involved in at least the first couple right. blues festivals. Right. I never met him while I was living in Ann Arbor. Well... Last year, when I was thinking about moving up here, I get a call from Mike Erlewine. Well, a message, not a call. And he wanted to interview me because he knew I had a book out on Michigan, um, well, mid-Michigan musicians. So he wanted to, and he knew I was into the blues and managed a lot of the Michigan blues artists. So he... Uh, wanted me to come to Big Rapids yeah, to his does. studio and to interview me because he has a thing on YouTube. He's got all these interviews on YouTube. Oh, tons really? of stuff on there. And um, he talks about the different blues festivals. So nothing happened. He never got back to me, never got back to me. And then he was going to move out of Big Rapids and now he changed his mind, I guess, but I never did get to meet him. Okay. I yeah. know his two daughters are very talented. Yeah, uh, May or May Lord. and Ann. Yeah, we uh, we saw May. She performed at the uh, Midland Center for the Arts. Oh. You know, on that, they've got this little house in the back where mm. the performers perform on the, like the front porch, and you can sit out in the... Sort of like in the lawn, bring your own chairs. And Did watch. you have an R and B band? Uh, That's what I really like. <laughs> uh, no, it wasn't an R and B, but she had, I think, a couple people. No, this is a full it. band no. with a trumpet player. Really? And, wow. Yeah, there's a two or three of them on YouTube. They're really good. Wow. Okay. And when she played at uh, Top of the Park, not last year, but two years ago in Ann Arbor, that's what she brought her r&b band yeah and i mean just listening to her at uh at dow gardens there i, I wouldn't have thought of her uh, fronting an r and you know like a big band I, and she yeah. does some great wow. r&b tunes man <laughs> <laughs> sounds good uh, but anyways mike erlewine yeah he's uh He's been posting a lot of pictures lately. He's an interesting guy. You know, he started the All Music Guide. Right. I, I did a whole bunch of bios for him. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's an interesting site. I go to that uh, every Friday to see, you know, what's being released. Uh, oh. You know, they have a you know a little uh, 
small reviews and sometimes you can uh, listen to some segments but you know my what I'll usually do is I'll read through and then uh, go to iTunes and see if it's on iTunes and you can hear a little bit more of the the album if it sounds interesting so he sold that company a yeah. few years ago right. I don't I bet you are they it. still in Ann Arbor do you know well uh, Stephen Erlewine still writes for it which oh. I'm assuming is his, maybe his son could he's be. one he's one of the main writers because uh, Dan I think that's his brother yeah he's a uh, guitar guitar yeah he uh, he repaired what they call it yeah he repaired guitars for Albert Collins and Albert yeah. King and yeah he's a lot I guess of, he's lot world of, famous right? yeah yeah so an interesting band you know and they never recorded anything they, hmm. you know they were they were these guys uh, with about Iggy in, on drums yeah an interesting <laughs> or James Osterberg. Michigan band that were real blues purists and uh, I don't know if they didn't think they could do justice to the songs of the masters or what uh, but they they never put out a you know an official recording and they they played the teen clubs oh mm -hmm. you know, they, they played uh, at daniel's den there's yes, some pictures definitely. of uh yeah, yeah, on yeah. drums yes, right. yeah yeah what book did you bring there fred the boogeyman book oh that's uh it's a book on john lee hooker okay i uh you have a part in that no just a good book no it's just i thought i'd bring it in case someone asks them hard question that i didn't well, know i've got a hard question dig oh, into that no. book come on. <laughs> i'm surprised your name's not in that book when did that book come out do you know 2000 um charles shar murray oh he's pretty well regarded really? rock rock and that's a famous john Lee blues right photo oh yeah California. i love it oh yeah yeah that's the santana era that's right. yeah for sure yeah yeah well i guess and he lived in oakland and there was always people over there all the time you know was he was, he was he synonymous for having an attitude at all or, or rudeness or was he always kind or i always hear I, for some reason my memory of the 90s when i read about john lee hooker was that he was really hard to talk to or something or really difficult to get a hold of or and it's amazing that van morrison and carlos santana tracked him down and was able to do things with him i know he had some big hit albums during that period but I just remember something weird about that era, and I was like, well, "Was it his the way he was, or?" Yeah, I don't. Just how he I handled don't remember. himself. I don't. Yeah. It seemed like the people that I knew that knew him, uh, he was always friendly. That's cool. Well, that's good to hear. He stuttered, so maybe that was what was he hard. He talk a whole lot. Maybe that. that's what made it hard for people to get. In, and I didn't realize that at the time. I just assumed he was being difficult, and I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, I think people generally, you might be a little uncomfortable. Yeah. Talking with somebody that's got a speech impediment. It makes total I sense. I uh, yeah. that makes wow. Yeah. And you always see these pictures of him, and he looks so badass. Like, hey, yeah. hey no one's fooling with John Lee, you know. I I didn't. Uh, <laughs> remember this when we were talking about uh uh you know some of the the groups he played with uh one of the first rock bands that he worked with was an english band called the groundhogs oh yeah and there's some great youtube video out there oh, okay. of them playing behind john lee hooker really? and that's a band that they're pretty uh, cool yeah, but I, you know, I don't, I don't know if I've ever seen any albums by the Groundhogs. And, They're you know, hard to all find. The, all the interest in uh, British bands, uh, you know, starting when the Beatles hit in 1964. But I don't remember ever hearing anything about the Groundhogs. But boy, that's some of the the uh, performances you can find on YouTube. With the, they were pretty good, That's you know, cool. and they, I wonder they if, complimented John Lee Orca really well. Wonder if Mike Vernon produced those. Could have been because he, he did a lot of the early the, blues. Yeah, right, he British was the British. Blues. British blues you know, producer. there was a reissue on their one of their albums recently because I that name just popped up in the last year or two, and I'm I don't know if I saw it at the Electric Kitsch or something, but there is a Groundhog's album out and really? oh, yeah. reissued, and. I remember hearing something on either NPR or something, and it blew my mind. Like, wow, how come nobody knows about these guys? I had no clue they were the backing band for 
Johnny. Well, they, they weren't really his backing band, I guess, you know, but they had worked with him and maybe they backed him when he toured in England. Uh, they were that's probably just the a case. Early British blues, blues band. band. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. There were a lot of them, uh, you know, all those John Mayall combinations and, uh, you know, like the early Fleetwood Mac. And, I like and, those. Um, when like uh, Albert King goes to Europe or what is it, uh, Muddy goes to when BB goes to Europe and it's always you got Ron Wood, Steve Winwood, and blah blah blah. They're always in the band. You know, it was the same backing band for all these blues guys. That well, yeah, the studio there, there was in the seventies. There were these things called the London sessions. That's the London sessions. That's it. Yeah, you know, the Howlin' Wolf one. I oh, really like phenomenal. Um, but yeah, there were there were several of those, and you know, you would get members of the Rolling Stones and yeah. uh, you know, Blue Blue Mag did an early one with uh i think oldest band they did that in chicago fleetwood mac in chicago yeah they came to chicago that was our first trip to america they got to record there yeah that was a pretty cool thing for peter green mcfleetwood right that's one of my favorite eras i'm a huge peter green fan so it's like i've been watching videos on him lately oh yeah peter's the he's my favorite so uh, we got to meet him a few times oh really Mm mm-hmm Anyway, I have, I love those uh, London sessions. That's the whole thing. I was looking, I couldn't remember the name of them, but I was uh, somebody who just posted on Winwood's website uh, how cool it was for him to be 17, 18, 19 years old. And yeah, he's the he's the organ player on majority of them sessions. Yeah. Bill Wyman's on bass and blah blah blah. Just always a cool band. I'm amazed they didn't get anybody from Fleetwood Mac or Mayall to do those at the time. But you know. It was probably who was associated with the studio they went to. Well, right. I'm sure that had a lot to do with it. And I'm amazed also, I guess, which why I brought that up was John Lee doesn't have one. But then again, he wasn't like a, he didn't have the wolf or the muddy or any of that um, behind him back then. He didn't really jump forward until well, the 90s, right? So, Well, he had that album with Ken. Oh, Lee. that's true. That's and actually, that was a bigger hit. You know, then any that of these was a pretty London, big, yeah, yeah. The, none of the London sessions ever made the you know, the one, top one hundred albums. One whole yes, side, yeah. one boogie. <laughs> one I boogie think chill. it was one song. No, I mean, just a. Oh, I don't a think boogie. it was boogie chill, but it was a boogie. Oh wow. Well, well that, that was Ken Heat's thing, I right? Mean, you know, they. <laughs> I, there was all kinds of albums where they just took that John Lee Hooker, that famous John Lee Hooker riff, and just went with it, you know, for <laughs> like 20 minutes, whole side of the uh, of the album, just one big endless boogie. Oh, that's cool. Uh, uh, yeah, those guys were pretty interesting, though, Candy. Heat. I liked them back in the, back in the day. Yeah. yeah, I got to meet uh, the race player, Larry Taylor. Larry Taylor, yes. Um, some of those guys, Larry Taylor and... Um, Greg Taylor, the piano player. I think it was Greg Taylor. He just or died Kane recently. Did he he? might have been in one ver- a later version of Canned Heat. Okay, yeah, I don't, I don't remember a keyboard player for them, but... Uh, but uh, Larry Taylor, he backed up Laz- him and uh, Linwood Slim and, and uh, a couple other guys would back up Lester when we'd go to California. Wow, wow, that's cool. Did uh, what year? I'm assuming that John Lee's in the Hall of Fame. Am I right? Oh yeah, a uh, Rock Legends Hall. Yeah, and a couple of his songs, "Boogie Chillin" and uh, "Boom Boom," are legendary Michigan songs. So. Cool. Yeah. He got into the Cleveland Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in '91. '91. Yeah. Do you remember the year he went in here? Uh, I'm gonna say. Probably 2006 or 2007 would be my guess. Right on. That's so cool. I mean, there's two serious artists that uh, <laughs> that people can look up, and there's a, a tremendous musical history that we've gone over today between Del Shannon and John Lee Hooker, two completely different styles and uh, two very Michigan-based and both very uh, influential oh completely in their own way yeah, yeah. you know yeah. In, in different areas but uh you know uh giants in the field no doubt Any, anybody have any final comments on those two cats well, i don't know fred no. what do you think well thank you, you guys. i guess we probably said it all right? <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> there's always so many little nuggets that pop out yeah. i want i want to just derive on more when stuff I, with you guys when you guys get talking i'm like oh oh oh, oh. 
oh, I'm thinking of this. I want to hear that. You when know? I drive home, I'll think of something. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah, yep. This will be this will be web fodder for uh, Facebook. <laughs> oh yeah. By the way, the, this happened. Uh, we're gonna say goodbye to Doctor J for a couple weeks here, and uh, Fred and I are gonna try to come back and see if we can put together something in between. In the meantime, we want to thank uh, Studio One Six Three here in Essexville, Alan Garcia, and uh, the wonderful hospitality we get out here at the studio, and all the wonderful podcasters that you, you guys are almost up to five hundred now on Facebook and the fans and the likes and the followers and. Uh, Without you guys, uh, we wouldn't have this going on, and, and it's beautiful to have these two guys I'm sitting with that, to share their uh, backstories, memories, and all the incredible stuff that they've done alone to bring the music forward here in our state. So until the next podcast, we are the MMHP and the 989, and we will see you later. Thank you for tuning in. Additionally, Dr. J can be reached at michiganrockandrolllegends.com. Sir Fred can be hit up at fredrife.com and Scott through scottbakermusic.com. You can also search Michigan Music History Podcast on Facebook and YouTube. You've been listening to the MMHP in the 989. From all of us at the podcast, we want to thank you for tuning in. The first song is...